going to launch into a new sermon series to start this new year out. And the sermon series is titled, All for All. My all for God's all. All of me for all of God. All I am for all I can be. All I can give for all he has given. All I have become for all I am created to be. All for all. And this morning we're going to base this sermon on a quote from John the Baptist. He says, You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. And for this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. John the Baptist confesses a profound truth and lesson for all of our lives, not just for His life. He, meaning Christ, must become greater, I must become less. Because the one who comes from above is above all. You know, since Adam and Eve and the spiritual consequences of their rebellion against God, all of their descendants, that's us, we humans in the image of God, are born with sick hearts. Our spirit is separated from God's spirit and is not effective for our souls and our bodies. Yes, we are each born in God's royal image. But I was born with Aaron's heart. Aaron's heart is not immortal. Controlled by Aaron, my heart is hard and merciless. That makes for an unhappy and unsuccessful living. I need better control. I need less Aaron and more God. I need a new heart from God. One that will give me eternal life and allow me to live with loving motives. Now God wants my heart to center on God. See, God's not satisfied just being part of my life. Being only a part of my life means... Aaron is still in control. That's not good enough. After all, I was born with God as part of my life. We're all born in the image of God. So whether we accept that or not, doesn't matter. God is part of who we are. But God wants me to live eternally with God dwelling in my heart. But God is only going to come into my heart if God is invited there. I must surrender control of my life and my will to God. There are a number of different ways to describe that surrender. Talk about being born from above, born again, a new creation, born of the Spirit, receiving a new heart, 
being saved. Whatever term you use, all of them refer to an individual coming into a right relationship with God through a free choice of will. And that results in an immortal soul and abundant living. Now such a choice seems like a huge risk to a lot of people. We tell ourselves, oh, man, I'll be giving up who I really am. I'll, I would be losing myself to surrender like that. But actually, that surrender is when I gain my full potential. That surrender is when I really find myself. You know, since God created me, God knows me better than I know myself. I have no idea how many hairs are on my head. So when I surrender to God, God can now lead me into the fulfillment of my life that God knows about me. So what seems like a huge risk is actually the smartest decision we can make. God enters my life and makes me whole. I'm giving a new spiritual heart, the heart of Christ, which then unites and completes my body and soul and spirit into the intended nature that God formed originally. The prophet knew about that. He says this, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. You know, it's the same principle as orange. We know orange, right? Mixing red and yellow to make orange. You might say red, me, needs to decrease in relation to total volume. And God, yellow, must be added increasing in total volume. And the result of a decrease in red and an increase in yellow is a new color. Orange, a new heart, a new life. We've been using orange to describe how God wants us to become disciples of Christ. We said disciples are orange. Citizens of heaven, members of God's family, people who have received salvation. We are new creation. Now my goal is not to become yellow. I can never be yellow. God is yellow. My goal is to be orange, to have less of me and more of God until I turn into a blaze orange. That's who I was made to be. There's another way to think about it. Many of us learned about these mathematical signs when we were in middle school. Actually, it's when I was in junior high school. But now it's middle school. Amen? Okay. Greater than and less than. I am less than God because God is greater than me. In fact, nothing is greater than God. He who is in me, in my heart, is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Amen. Say greater than. Greater. Yeah, he who is in me is greater. 
he who is in the world. God's grace is any sin. Yeah. God's love is any force in the universe. Greater love has no one than this. And they would lay down one's life for others. When we enter into a right relationship with God, we become different. And people see that difference. Again, the prophet knew this. For Zion's sake, prophet speaks for God, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give you. Paul says this about our old self and our new self. He writes to the Galatians and he says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Now, really he's not talking about the physical act there. What's he really talking about? He says, either with the law or without the law. Either with the law or without the law means nothing. doesn't mean anything. What counts is the new creation. He wrote to the Corinthians, Paul did, and he said, Now we have received the spirit that is from God. We have the mind of Christ. And then he says, Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to Christ. You see, in my new creation, I become Christ-like. Less of me, more of Christ. And I take each thought captive to Christ, meaning I begin to filter my thoughts through what is pleasing to Christ. Listen, we've said this before, not all thoughts are my own. This is just a great lesson in deception for us. The evil one can and does put thoughts in my head. I must discern those thoughts which is the beauty of having God's Holy Spirit dwelling within me. You see, before the Holy Spirit, we do not have the ability to discern those thoughts. But with the Holy Spirit, we are in a whole new place of living now. If we have not been aware of that before today, this one point alone is probably the most important lesson we can take into 2014 as God's people. Now here's why thoughts are so crucial. Thoughts produce attitudes. Attitudes produce motives. Motives control our words and our actions. And friends, it's our words and actions that change the world. You see that chain? It's so powerful. It's so important. Hmm? Here's an example. When, in our thinking, 
we go from considering ourselves as number one, meaning being self-focused, thinking selfishly, we go from that to choosing to be number three. That's a self-sacrificing position. That changes the world. That shift in our thinking, which changes our attitudes and motivates our words and actions, that changes the world. Now I say, why number three? It's pretty simple. God's first, others are second, and I'm third. Now, I'm not third because I'm less than anybody else. Wrong. God created us all equal. I'm third because in my new thinking, I'm willing to volunteer to put others before me. I'm willing to self-sacrifice myself. You see that attitude and the motive and therefore the words and the actions that are as a consequence of that. You see, it's about Christ's priority, more of Christ and less of me. It's not about my will or my desire. It's about Christ's priority in my life. Paul says, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of of glory. Godly love offers sacrifice. Christ sacrificed his life for us. And only through Christ can we achieve a godly love and respect for other people. You know, with our old self, we would try to save our own neck. With our new self, we would offer ourselves for others. With our old self, we would get all we can. With our new self, we would give all we can. With our old self, we would try to get people to serve us. And in our new self, we seek to serve others. In our old self, we would say whatever we need to. And in the new self, we will speak only the truth. In the old self, we would love our family and friends. But with the new self, we love even our enemies. Our old self was self-centered. Our new self is God-centered. Our old self had an unregenerated heart. And our new self has a heart filled with Christ. Our old self was vengeful, and our new self is forgiving. There's a huge difference. Now here's a confusing fact in this. I turn my life, my heart, over to Christ. I surrender one time. See, that's a decision of my will that involves my identity. God accepts that surrender and validates it by giving me the Holy Spirit to dwell in my heart who will never leave me. I have a new identity. I am a new creation at that point, one time. However... I still maintain my free will. In other words, I still get to choose. And so turning my will, turning my decision-making over to Christ is a daily struggle. That's the art of learning how to live according to my new heart. We all struggle doing that, living as the people we really are. Now, there's lots of different translations of the Scripture. I'm going to read some Scripture to us right now from one of the newest translations because I think it offers us some fresh words that help us understand some 
familiar passages that when we hear them in a slightly different way, they pop out to us. So I'm going to be reading to us from someone guess where. Romans chapter 8. Imagine that. Beginning with the ninth verse. And I'm reading from the translation called The Message. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he will do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from your dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. So, don't you see? We don't owe this do-it-yourself life one red cent. There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and then get on with your new life. God's Spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. Not too long ago, Rob read this next verses to us at the Connect Worship. This resurrection life that you received from God it's not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who He is, and we know who we are. Father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us that message of reconciliation. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. <clears throat> God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true 
righteousness and holiness. This new year, 2014, we will be focusing on being in personal ministry, each one of us. That means each one of us choosing to follow God's thoughts with the appropriate attitudes and the right motives for all of our words and actions as God's people in the world. You see, words and actions are how we serve other people. Amen? Those words and actions form our ministry. You know, that's what those little salty servant tabs are all about. About being God's hands and feet. About being God's mouth. That our words and our actions would come from the right motives because of the right attitude, because of the right thoughts. This new year, what we want is to help each other to live all for all. To know who we are in our new creation and to live that way together. As we begin that process, it's our privilege to start the new year at the Lord's table. You do not have to be a member of this church. You do not have to be a member of any church to come to this table. The invitation is not our invitation, it's God's invitation. And if you hear God speaking in your heart, you are invited to be a part of this holy sacrament today. Each and every one. As we come and as we prepare to to share in the body and the blood of Christ. Let's remind ourselves and let's be honest with God. This isn't God rewarding us in any way, shape, or form. None of us deserve this. It's a gift. And so I ask we would just take a few moments, each of us in our own hearts and minds, and we would recognize who God is. There's nothing greater than God. And who we are. And then from that place, we would come to his table. Take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we would confess our rebellion and our sins, our unloving words and actions that offend you. We would repent of those. And we seek and we accept your forgiveness. your unmerited grace and your unconditional love.
with grateful hearts. In Christ's name, amen. Would our servers please come? Now let's join together in a prayer of thanksgiving and consecration. Heavenly Father, you have granted us humble access to this table. And we now come acknowledging our true place. Offered to us through grace and not merit. And we're mindful of the sacrifice that provides this invitation to us. We think about how Christ took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. And likewise, how he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, which is my lifeblood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. And so we ask in this prayer that through the power, through the majesty, through the mystery of your Holy Spirit, this bread and this cup would be for each of us the body and the blood of Christ as we share in it today, that we would be united with Christ, that we would be one with Christ and one with each other as we become Christ's body Christ's words, Christ's actions in the world today. Through your Son, our Savior, the Lord of the cross, we pray. Amen. <laughs>